makes me feel a little more comfortable already. But yeah, I guess dude. that's I guess that's anybody feels flattered when somebody knows what they've done. But doing the podcast is weird because you never know if the person knows who you are, or just thinks you're some other person from some zine that's going to ask them a bunch of dumb questions. So you never know. And if the yeah. person that you're talking to, if it's somebody you wanted to talk to, but they didn't know who you were, then you feel stupid having a conversation. You feel like almost like, well, I better just babysit them through an interview. Right. You know what I mean? Versus <laughs> talk to the person because they're like, why is this dumb kid? trying to talk, you know, talk if he yeah. didn't, you know, so it's, it's nice to know if somebody knows who you are, or what's going on. But of course I know, you know what I'm up to and doing because, uh, Joey Sturgis tones has been sponsoring the podcast, which I really appreciate. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we looked into, you know, how can we start expanding, um, in different ways? Cause right now we're kind of tapped out in the, in the normal ways that we do stuff. So mm-hmm. podcast was definitely on the list and Ryan, who's my, uh, A and R guy at JST, uh, mentioned you guys. And mm-hmm. so I was like, yeah, let's do it. Well, I, I just, you know, I get the biggest kick out of people that are willing to try new things and do stuff. I just feel like, you know, the only thing that I divide people, a way that I look at and divide people is, uh, not in a judgmental way, but there's people that will do stuff and people that don't want to do stuff. I mean, that's as simple as I can break <laughs> down people that, that try things or, or won't. Like most people, for instance, never leave the town they grew up in or try anything. And I was hearing somebody today say that most people are generally feel like they're unhappy and unsatisfied. And also, I heard it was Colin Cowherd on the sports talk that I was listening to, and he said that. But also, most people never leave the city or state they're ever from, too. So I just yeah. think that's a metaphor for people don't do stuff. That's one it's way. It's funny, to fix man, because you can have in the same conversation, you can have someone at a bar watching a game, uh, and then on, during the commercial break, complain that they don't have any money, and it's like, well, you're watching the game at a bar, yeah. and instead of you know building a business online. Um, so, if that gives you any any kind of indication of what type of person I am, you know, every day I'm learning, I'm building, I'm trying to make my current business is better trying to start new businesses always it's that's my you know it's like uh my passion and so i don't uh i entertain myself by doing that and so i think that's why it's part of my success yeah i mean just to just to enjoy i mean it's the thing about enjoying what you do and there's obviously drive there but i'm curious what uh I mean, to what degree would you take that? Like, uh, there's also the stereotype of entrepreneurs and grind, and you always got to be grinding and stuff like that. And to some degree where it goes so far on that end that I feel like, well, is there is the is grinding just the goal in itself? Because sometimes that gets feels like I don't know if there's a work life balance there or, or kind of stuff like that. How, do you yeah. ba- do you think how do you think of that as trying to balance versus just always be working? Do you? I like, think that's. Th- do you like well, to chill out magic. and do stuff too? Yeah, I mean, that's the magic of, of finding the perfect life is figuring out that balance. Um, I really like to subscribe to the idea that there really is no such thing as a retirement. You have to just factor it into your life uh, somehow to where you have a little bit of work, you have a little bit of play. Um, I, I also believe that the idea of being rich is – not just about money. It's about being rich in health or in love or, you know, uh, in your relationships with people, those kinds of things Mm -hmm. are what I would call being rich. You know, there's somebody who can not have a, a very impressive bank account, but they can be the richest person in the world because they have so many friends and they are healthy and they enjoy life and, you know, they're happy. And I think happiness also is a choice And so for people who are unhappy, it's like you're choosing to be that way. Um, All you need to do is make a choice and and change, make a change more importantly in your life um, in order to start being happy if you're unhappy. Yeah. You know, I think there's some times and some people where certainly they've got a set of circumstances that it might not be easy to overcome or make choices. But for the most part, I think that's true. What is it for you that you do outside of work, though? What are the other things you care about? I love boating. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm often in the sea whenever I can afford it and whenever I can go. Yeah, boating's expensive, <laughs> I don't own, I'm sure. I don't, oh, yeah, I don't own my own boat, and I, I wouldn't want to be a captain, or I, you know, I wouldn't want to have to deal with the headache of the boat, but I enjoy using boats, mm-hmm. so <laughs> there's that. Do you have family, um, kids, anything like that? I do not have any children, um, 
I just sort of live with my fiance. We live in here out in the country by ourselves. Um, we have a really big property, so it's very quiet. We don't see a lot of people. It's very peaceful out here. I think the reason why I went so, I, I kind of did this really crazy, like, seesaw thing mm -hmm. where my life was really busy very stressful and then i went like complete opposite i moved out in the country it's quiet where were you, you before know. uh i mean it's not like i was in a big city or anything but i was near civilization I, i've lived in different places i spent 26 years in indiana but mm -hmm. um during the peak of my career i lived in michigan and i lived in a place called rochester which is about an hour north of detroit so now i'm an hour west of detroit next to the cows and the horses. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I just went to an extreme. I went from one extreme to another where it's busy, crazy lifestyle, super stressful to laid back country living, you know, stars are shining bright at night and uh, not a peep. You know, most days I don't really hear any sounds or anything. So it's, that's, it's nice. that's real interesting given the, the nature of the stuff you do, because on some hand, people think, well, you need to be in L.A. or you got to be somewhere. But on the other hand, it seems like you just do several records a year. Uh, and also you're doing all this other tech stuff and software development and audio software and those things. So it's so tech heavy that it probably is a nice balance to be out in the country, too. Right. It's a weird thing because people usually put tech with urban center typically. Absolutely. Um, and for a while, you know, I, I actually, for most of my career, I would say I've always been destination recording, which means the band could be from England. Uh -huh. But if they work with me, like they come to my house. Yeah. Um, and it's been like that for a long time. It's funny, you know, when we bought this house, we just assumed that it would have internet like you do most places. Cause <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we figured out very quickly that there is no internet here, so we actually had to pay. Um, we had to pay a company to come out and run a fiber line directly to our house because, uh, with the amount of tech stuff yeah. I do, There's just, yeah. I gotta have. How yeah, much does so, that cost to get the fiber line? Oh my gosh, it's five figures. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. hilarious! It but totally, expensive. I mean, it's unavoidable. It's not. I don't even know if you want to say worth it, but unavoidable given the setup. I mean, you probably save five figures in where you live compared to if you bought it in the city, though. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, the thing that's interesting about it is that um, I needed that internet connection before it was done. So for about oh. eight months while I waited for them to build it, I had to. I was running a. a it's like a 4G box. It's kind of like mm -hmm. having your cell phone, but the purpose of a it is... A tethered thing, yeah. Yeah, strictly internet. I was paying 1200 a month for that. Yeah, and it was so probably relatively slow. Yep, mm -hmm. and so, you know, nine grand of that in one year. I'm like, dang, I mean, this is going to pay for itself in, in just a few years. <laughs> wow. So... Yeah. Okay, so I, what I want to know about, what you know, I mean, you know a lot of stuff that I don't know, which is, could keep me interested for a long time, but what I'm really interested in is how do you do software development of audio stuff like that? I mean, I don't know if we're, I just, I'm really ignorant on the, how does it, how does, what is the process of developing audio software? So, you know, for the first time I ever heard of it, of modeling and you know stuff being digital based stuff was when the, when line six first came out with their whatever that first 212 combo w was do you remember that the uh the line the first uh, the very first spider? line six amp no it was even back before that they had this just it was just the first digital type of amp and it was software modeled things and it had the marshall and all this stuff it was very archaic it just had a two uh, two digital digit display thing that you had to go through and right, whatever okay, yeah. and i had that amp um in 97 or something like that. Uh, and uh, I just, I've still to this day don't understand the process of modeling and how it gets done because it seems like the people that know the software so well, I just don't know how they interface with the, the people that understand it musically and dynamically and what's the process of, let's just say, copying a, like your new thing, the, the, the new one, what is it called? The SOAR? SOAR? Yeah, yeah, so yeah, just, let's just jump in there and talk about the SOAR. And, man, I genuinely do not mean this because you sponsor the podcast and we sell this stuff on here. This is something I'm very interested in. But how do you emulate that stuff? Who's the software guy and who's the sound guy? How do those things interface? I, I don't even know. I feel ignorant on it. But what's the chain of command to sure. architect and build something like that? I mean, well, we're about to dive deep into this. So, uh, first of all, 
the very interesting thing about audio software is that there's really two two sides of it that live in one world where and, but in reality there's two worlds so i'll try to explain okay. this okay so there's two worlds you have analog world and you have digital world mm -hmm. okay so in analog world just pretending there's no computers you know you put a microphone in front of a speaker the speaker pushes air and then the air travels and hits the diaphragm of the microphone and mm -hmm. makes that move, which generates like an electrical signal, which goes in through a preamp and gets amplified, which then goes into a compressor and, you know, all kinds of things happen with transistors and, mm -hmm. and capacitors and all these things, right? Then you have the digital world. So once you hook up your audio signal and you get it into the computer, now it's been converted to zeros and ones. Right. So there's two things there's like two schools of thought once it's in the computer you have the digital school of thought where well now that i have these zeros and ones i can do math problems with them i can do i can run it through algorithms i can mathematically change those zeros and ones and get different sounding results or and then you have the analog modeling part of of the digital world mm -hmm. where now we're trying to we're taking that that signal that's been converted to zeros and ones and then trying to sort of like emulate processing it as if it was not zeros and ones and yes. it was still a real signal in the real world. Thank you for getting me to that fundamental question because that's what I was going to ask. Do do you literally emulate each type of transistor with its resistance and what it does functionally and build in the computer all the transistors and capacitors that make up a distressor, for instance? Is that how you model uh, something like that? That's where it gets that's where it gets interesting for me because if you actually go back and look at our entire product line, all of our products are 100% digital until SOAR. Okay. So none of the products before SOAR are they're not trying to emulate transistors, they're not trying to emulate capacitors, anything like that. It's all 100% math. Okay. And um and actually that's how some of the plugins run so efficiently. And then if you look at another line of plugins like the UAD stuff, they have that card that you install in your computer mm -hmm. and that card has DSP chips and those chips are intended to try and emulate those things that you're talking about. So that's the two different ways. So the UAD stuff is modeling each part, each component of the original thing. As much as they can get away with. Now they, yeah. they do simplify when it makes sense. You know, that they've it's a trade, it's a balance always. It's like we can model every single little solder point of this compressor, but then it'll be the only plugin you can run on your computer. <laughs> oh, because it's so much math that would have to go in to support that. The, pro the yeah. processing and computational thing gets and out then, of hand when you do that. And what they do is really what they do is they will go in and analyze something and say, well, you know, do we really want to spend 50% CPU power to change the sound by 0.3%? Mm -hmm. You know, maybe not. So, I think the design of some of these uh, more analog accurate modeling things um, is just a balance of figuring out where's the 80-20, like what yeah. is the most responsible uh, thing for changing the sound. Mm -hmm. And for us, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, we're trying to make our stuff the most efficient. We're also trying to do our designs from an 80-20 perspective where it's like, you know, like for example, our Tone Forge line where we give you the chain – pre-configured so you can't mess it up uh if we made it to where you can like put the pedal over here and then you can move the speaker around and then you know you can change all the stuff in your tone it it kind of takes away from being able to make a good tone because you have too many choices and you can mm -hmm. make bad choices that's, um, that's true so, so that's been our big approach to our plugins is that we want to make it to where you can't really make bad choices you can only make good ones and that does limit them sometimes, but that's okay. I mean, that's our niche. No, that's but, okay, and it's more of the it's more of a forward thinking way to look at it because there's something fundamentally weird about what we're doing now because, you know, there's guys like me who who grew up and learned engineering at the tail end of of the analog era as it was digital was coming on the scene, and I, I'm not some tape cutter. I, I haven't been splicing two inch tape or anything i mean i've, I've right. done a very limited amount but still um most things were analog as i learned recording and so even just four track recording from on a tascam in the 90s for me is still 
the the fundamental way I think about it, and I think about consoles, and I think about signal flow and processing in that way. And so then, you know, when digital was really viable, of course, all the plugins and all the processing, everything there was just new ways of it, it was just trying to take that into the computer so you were using the gear you were used to represented digitally but that's obviously not true with it, or necessary or and it's very limiting when you think about people who grown up with all recording being on computers and digital anyway it almost seems goofy to go back and try to emulate gear that is not we just don't even need to do that and so it can be confusing and and I think we're still a long way off from probably where we're headed with that stuff, but there's really no reason to have the gear em emulated going forward. It's just whatever we can come up with mathematically and new new formats of processing and stuff that doesn't even look familiar to, to an old guy would be obviously the way to go in the future. I think that's exactly where we're at, and that's, I think, also the reason why I'm able to start my company and, and run it every day because – we're living in a time period now where, um, uh, you know, whoever has the number one hit on the on the charts right now may not even know what an 1176 is or how to use it, mm -hmm. or even what it sounds like. You mean not the artist, but the producer may not even know. Right, right, right. yeah. Just exactly. So, right. They may have never sat at an SSL or seen one. Yeah, for instance. So how yeah. amazing is that? And so that raises the question: What kind of product should we make? Should we be making? And my argument always goes back to this what is the goal at the end of music and it's either to connect or to entertain i i think mm -hmm. so what are if if you're cloning if you're making the most perfect clone of an 1176 how does that help entertain people or how does that make humans connect musically so if the artist is trying to write a song i'm trying to get them from what's in their head or whatever they're going through to that finished product as quickly as possible like destroying all the barriers in between their creativity and the end product, the uh -huh. end result. And I don't think that like an 1176 clone or anything like that helps the artist accomplish no. that. <laughs> it's just a tool. I mean, it really, yeah. like, I, I like, I like pro tools in the sense that it's so illustrative of the fact that this is just a toolbox. It doesn't matter if you beat detective or edit something or manually do it. There's a million ways to do it, a million possible tools, and it just depends on what you're trying to do kind of thing. And so that that's the same way it is with an 1176 compressor. It's just like it's a great tool if you're very familiar with the settings and the attack and you know what the release is and you're comfortable with it and you have a clone of that or a real one, great. I mean, you know, I happen to know that one a little bit, so I'm comfortable with it. Like, I'll pull it up before I pull up something I don't know. But I understand this unknown new compressor that has weirder knobs or sliders that, you know, it's just not as familiar or maybe it doesn't give me as much control. It may do the same thing. I just don't know it yet. But that's because I'm an old guy. So that I'm in the wrong on that, probably. It's not. I, I can't I, swear I, by some original 1176 or even an emulation of that. I don't. It's not necessarily any better. Yeah, and I think the the interesting thing now is that, um, you know, I hate to drop this word, but millennials or whatever. That's okay. Uh, they don't. You're they don't one of them, aren't you? I guess. Okay. Maybe you could consider <laughs> You're one of the millennial. oldest ones of them. That maybe. <laughs> um, when they sit down, they don't care. Uh, they that's a, that's make a good thing. Yeah, that's a good thing. That's what I'm saying. No reason to hold on to. Oh, the kids these days, they don't uh, wouldn't know how to write automation on a console. If, if it doesn't matter. <laughs> Yeah. And I, I think that's the beautiful thing that uh, the Internet has allowed everything to sort of live in the same space and compete with each other. Mm -hmm. You know, so you can put Joey Sturgis Tones, which is a creative uh, plug in company right next to somebody who's trying to give you an SSL inside of your laptop. Mm -hmm. um, and we live in the same space, and but we do different things. And I, I think it's cool. It's all important, obviously, but. I just I really think that my mission is more closely to the the end product which is the the song or the recording. Uh -huh. Um I'm always trying to help you make a song or help you make a recording and do it in a creative way. So is there gear that you ditch like you just write off or renounce or don't care about? What are some of the more progressive things that you're like, "Yep, don't even care about that, don't even need it," you know. You know, I've never done a record on a console, so wow, that's so cool. Yeah, and I, you know, I have over a hundred records now, so I think that might be interesting just to see if 
if that would change my mind about the analog world. Um, I do. You've never of, done a record on an analog console or a big one. You don't have a big console or anything. No. I've and you could you could one. have one if you wanted one. It's not a matter of money. No, and I've used one uh, just to monitor with uh -huh. uh, when I was working on a project in NRG in LA, but I've never actually mixed on one or like you know put a kick through one and like EQ it. Right. And, and, That's amazing. Well, actually, I did do that one time. Uh, when I recorded a drum library, but not for a record. Uh -huh. So, and the part of the drum library was to, I wanted to make sure that the SS sound, SSL sound was on there, like as a part of the drum sound. Mm -hmm. So that's on purpose, but yeah. So uh, for me, you know, I've always been in the box. I've always recorded multi-track. So like one guy at a time, um, never really recorded the band all playing at once. Uh, except for uh, one of the Devil Wears Prada records I did, we we tracked all the uh, the bed, the initial bed was all tracked live, and then we went over top of it. But that's cool. Typically, when I do an album, I will record one guy at a time. So start with a click track, record all the the riffs like throughout the whole song, real kind of sloppy, whatever, just to get like a baseline of how everything fits, and then have the drummer play over that. And I did that for a long time, and that eventually evolved into um, starting with all the music first and then doing the drums last, which uh -huh. we can talk about if you want to get into detail yeah, about that. Yeah, I'm into that process. I like that that way, too, to do drums last. I've done that a few times, and I, I do like it. Especially, you can modify yeah. the song so mm -hmm. you know as much as you want. Yeah, and it's not really fair for the drummer because like, they always complain, rightly so, that I mean, almost every drummer on every recording feels like, well, I didn't even know what the song was when I had to track the drums. Yeah, they don't. They don't, and that, and that's a valid complaint. I mean, you know, it's, if if you have the option to really understand the song after the vocals are done, because a lot of stuff happens in the studio, and you change guitar parts, and you change the form a lot of times after the drums are done, and so the drummer legitimately has a complaint. Like, man, I would have played that different now if I'd have known what the song was going to turn out like. And so, why not give him the chance? Yeah, and I I guess my my sort of big picture answer to your question was that. I like to let the art dictate the the technology. So if the band is like a Foo Fighters type band, maybe I will go do the record on a console, mm -hmm. you know, because their art dictates that type of capture process. Whereas, you know, the most of the bands that I've worked with, with in my career are very technical, very precision, very detailed oriented. So everything has to be perfect. And mm -hmm. if the shaker is a little offset from the kick drum, it doesn't sound right. And so like, that takes it a different approach and takes a different amount of technology to capture it properly. And that's why we record one person at a time. And that's why we use computers and editing. And that's why we bypass the console because it's a pain in the ass um, yeah. because the, the songwriter doesn't know how they want their song to go or, you know, we want to be able to make changes. And can you imagine changing a song 20 times on a console when you have to keep recalling it and keep, you know, it's, yep. it's just a headache and the workflow is slow and, and not adjusted to the modern uh, requirements of, of, of labels and management and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I think. Yeah, there's this other thing p partly that's caused this this bottle. I don't know, it's not a bottleneck, but there's a it's a, that efficiency is partly caused by something I think is it sounds like a bad thing, but it's a good thing. We're able to harness young musicians that are somewhat unrefined in their skills but have something to say and have all kinds of uh passion and attitude and stuff that leaps through that's amazing but they might not be th th as skilled as you would have traditionally needed someone to be to go record in a big analog studio to tape for instance so tons of yeah. t really emergent talent could have never recorded the old way because they just simply weren't good enough I and mean, when i think back to emory's first couple of records like they were great and, and enabled by technology in a way that if we had to play everything perfect live to tape, the records couldn't have really existed. We just weren't quite there. And when I go back and re record now, it's like, okay, I'm a seasoned guy. I can really play in time now compared to what I used to could for sure. But yeah. But I'm not, you know, 20 years old and just as mo excited and have all this unbelievable energy and ignorance and confidence and all this stuff that is so amazing that you can harness. And I'm not talking down to younger musicians because I was a younger, and some people are amazing at 19, way better than I am today. But there's people like me that w weren't really there musically, but had the attitude and the ideas and the songs and the 
the drive to do something, and technology was able to do that. So we're unable to unlock a bunch of young musicians with this technology stuff. It's really good. Yeah, and uh, I feel like the emergent of uh, technology of recording and the emerging technology of digital marketing or, or social media or whatever you want to call it, like all that stuff kind of rising up at the same time has been very interesting because it's been, a, I think, it's been a very big challenge for the music industry as a whole. Um, as we're seeing now, like in the news all the time, talking about artists not making very much money from mm-hmm. streaming and all this stuff. So, you know, it's 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 been a massive change. And, you know, the, the, I think the thing that the music industry has really dropped the ball on is being able to shift with it quick enough. Yeah. Um, you know, they didn't want to embrace the MP3 and they fought it and they fought it. But if they would have embraced it right at the beginning, um, we would be in a much different split pace right now. Yeah, I don't see the point in resisting change. I mean, I, no, nothing stays the same, and it's not going back. So, okay, like what? Just it does not matter. I mean, don't you want to be one of the first persons to accept the new reality? Like, yeah, I, I, that's that. It's just here's a new point of zero. Now, thus is born opportunity. If anything, if as long as you're as long as you can soberly accept what is true and be on the early side of that, then, okay, so at least you have access to new opportunity where, where slower people or people resistant to change don't. So, yes, there's things that are different and maybe harder, but there's always opportunity born in that I, I, if you are willing to accept new realities. Yeah, even 10 years ago when I was doing records in my, uh, in my Indiana home, uh, one thing I noticed is that every single band had at least one guy who was starting to download Fruity Loops on his laptop. Right. Like when we weren't, you know, if we were recording vocals and it's the bass player and the bass player has got nothing to do, he's somewhere in the bedroom downloading Fruity Loops and like messing around. Mm-hmm. And and I started, I started to see a trend where every band had at least one guy or two guys. And uh, I started to think about that. And I was like, man, at some point, like these bands are going to be able to record themselves and they're going to put me out of business. And then... And then for a few years, I had this attitude where like, oh, well, you can't replace producers. I mean, they have a, a gifted mind and they have their own unique perspective. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then I started to realize there's another movement happening. And this and what really made me realize it was YouTube and seeing that there's people on YouTube who start a channel and they entertain people in different ways. Like they might have um, videos about their life. They might have uh, their own music project they might have their own music videos that they created on their own which is their own songs uh-huh. and i was i started to see this independent community coming up and i was like i want to help that community somehow i want to empower those people and that was how everything got started really with all the you know the software companies i have an audio education company as well where we teach people how to mix and Mm-hmm. How to produce and That's stuff. Good. What's so, that called? I'm sure you can find it from your website and stuff. But yeah, uh, Unstoppable Recording Machine. Got if it. you just Google that, you'll find it. But yeah, so my I wanted to get behind that movement because I felt very passionate about it. Because I can remember even back in 2006, I had one of the first YouTube accounts, and I remember just like recording my day. Like I didn't even know it at the time, but I was vlogging. I was yeah. literally vlogging. You know, we would be in the drive-through at McDonald's ordering food and saying funny shit to the sorry yeah. i don't know if i can, curse yeah, you can. On here, uh to the people uh at the drive-thru and recording it and then l- uploading it that night uh and then all the fans of the band would come to my youtube channel and watch that video yeah um and so like i just love the idea that people are so empowered now and you can get on to yeah. the core no reason to resist it or gatekeep it or say you must come through me the yeah. oh wise Joey Sturgis, if you want to have it. <laughs> I mean, you know what I mean? You could share it and just be forward thinking and say, y'all, yeah, y'all go do it. Here's some software. Kick yeah. ass. Let's do it. Yeah, have fun. Make your, you do it. You know? And in and, and the back of my mind, I'm also thinking now I'm on even more records because people are, you know, people are using my compressor to mm-hmm. put on their vocals. So a little tiny piece of Joey Sturgis's mind. Oh, helped, that's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. Helped make cool. your, you know, your album, and that that made me feel really good because like now I could be a, a much bigger part of the community than I it, was able to do on my own. If I'm just making ten albums a year, I'm only on a hundred songs. Yeah. Whereas, let me pause you in there after you finish this thought. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I get that, but you just said ten albums a year, and I look. I was looking at your your credits and stuff. That's too many. 
I don't see how you can do ten records a year. Do you, are you able to do that reliably? Uh, That's in so, my heyday. Yeah, in my heyday, yeah, not and, anymore. <laughs> but you still are doing several. I mean, you do what? What are you? How many are you doing a year now? I've actually taken a little bit of a break just because our audio education company blew up. Oh, that's um, great! Started demand a lot more to- of my time. So now that I'm making money from that, I don't have to do as much albums and stuff. But the last album I did was uh, the album called The Black uh, by Asking Alexandria. Mm-hmm. I think it came out last year. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's the most recent thing I've done. Oh, so and you're not start- doing it. You're not even doing re- albums currently at the moment. You're working yeah, fully. It's, it's on been this like other a year. Yeah. yeah. Since I've done an album. But right you're now. not done doing albums. I mean, I'll take the right opportunity and, and I'm at a point in my career now where I can pick and choose and I can yeah. be very choosy if I want. So I'm, I'm thinking like I need to take the right project. Mm-hmm. The right project has to come along and it has to make sense. And yeah. I, I, even before then, when I needed to do albums, um, I only wanted to work with people that wanted me, not, not right. the other way around. So if somebody yeah. wanted me, like they literally needed me to help them make an album, that's when I would work with people. And now I'm even choosier than that. I have a lot of people that want to work with me, but I just want to make sure that I do the right project because a, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm a much bigger part of the industry because I'm helping all these people learn how to mix and record and, and, and be um, I'm putting a lot of time to that. I think I'm going to get more gratification from helping to make the next Joey Sturgis than I am to continue being Joey Sturgis, if that makes sense. No, it does. It does. And I imagine you'll continue to still do records, but you won't. But that is a huge problem when you get into recording, especially. I mean, it's, it's almost the biggest barrier possible, and it's the reason I didn't really pursue a career in producing and engineering outside of what I had already done because although I had plenty of opportunity, it seemed like the opportunities would be, I mean, it's like I was looking at it going, okay, so labels will send me their new scream, screamy, heavy bands that are their baby bands and pay me whatever, you know, a reasonable amount that would be worth it. And I felt like a real really dumb for feeling like I don't really feel like doing that though like of course I'd want to work on a record I want to work on but first of all I'd rather work on my own record almost always because that's going to be more satisfying and so then if I have to work on other people's records it and this is a very privileged place to be but it'd be like well I would only want to do it if I've really loved the music like uh, and there's so many other people that makes me feel bad in a sense because there's so many other people that are just trying to record local bands not not to mention signed bands that you know, right. maybe I don't prefer, but there's just no way I want to spend a month working nights and editing a band inside the micro parts of their tracks, which I love to do, but only if it really matters to me. And just there's just no way I want want to do that. There's just I knew I knew it'd be soul sucking kind of thing. And it's not like <laughs> I can choose to do the next Chili Peppers album or whatever. It's not or, or the new new Strokes album. If I could work on that, I would be glad to. But that's not the opportunities that I had. Although I did have good opportunities, but nonetheless, it has. It was just I knew that I didn't want to resent or make that work no fun because I worked on enough projects I didn't like to, that I didn't want to do it. Well, I think as a producer, you're being measured in so many different ways. Um, you're being measured on your emotional capacity to handle the band. You're being mm-hmm. measured on your ability to build a relationship with the the management, the labels, the bands. Mm-hmm. Um, you're being measured on your ability to get things done on time. You're being measured on your ability to create records that are big successes and having all these different ways of being measured can be quite stressful. And, and, um, I think when you are under that much pressure, you have the right to say, you know what, I'm not going to take just any record because Mm -hmm. it's, it's just not worth it. And, and in fact, the art will suffer if it's not the right project. And so, you know, it's hard to teach that to someone, especially people who want to jump into this yeah, industry, and like start right. turn to a career. So it's like, but how eh. would you get there? That's what I'm saying. That's that's not yeah. good thing to tell somebody is, well, don't work on anything until you're working with your favorite bands in the world, which is really the only <laughs> standard that I would even be willing to work on. You know, but there's no perfect way. There's yeah. no perfect way to dr- to jump in. And so a lot of the times I'll say, look, the f- the first couple years are going to be a grind, and yeah. there's going to be times that suck. But that's just part of, of anything, yeah. you know? 
So anything worth doing is hard. So. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So it, it I, I don't know this, but I'm curious in your workflow when you are doing a record, um, what your approach is as far as using an engineer, or do you do everything, and how do you keep schedule and stuff like that? I'm getting the feeling. I, I would have thought it may be differently, but after talking to you, I'm almost going to guess you're very hands-on in the in the tracking and editing. I've always been hands-on, and, and a lot of my, like the peak of my career, I was pretty much the only person working on the album. Mm -hmm. Um, but when the schedules become more demanding and there's more things that you're, you know, there's more expectations of you, uh, you just have to expand. You have, you need to bring in more people. And so, um, you know, when I did the black, I'll, I'll go back a couple albums. So when I did the black, it was just me and one other guy. And then like we tracked drums somewhere else, but that was pretty much it. So there's this kind of a small team. And then, Anything before that, though, like like maybe the le- the last Bless the Fall album I did, I've got a guy just for vocals. I got a guy just for guitars. I got a guy just for drums. You know, okay. I got a and guy... tell me what those guys do and how that works. And does that put you in project manager, overseer, Rick Rubin, guru territory, or what? Yes, absolutely, it does. <laughs> and I have very good reasons for doing it. Yeah, so, tell me, tell me. Um, I, let me explain this concept first because I think it's the most enlightening. It's if I want a vocalist to give me the best performance of his life, I have to be patient enough for him to pull that off in the amount of time it might take him to do. And if I'm also having to worry about moving each kick drum and also having to worry about the schedule for the guitar player because he has to go home, and I also have to worry about the management schedule, and I also have to worry about the the family, like is there a wife and a kid involved? And so – it starts to get to a point where I'm like, you know what? I want to remove myself from worrying about all those tiny little things and give those to someone else so that I can be more strict on what I want. Because if I sit there with that vocalist for eight hours and he still isn't giving me what I want, I might be willing to accept something subpar. I might be willing to say, well, you've been trying for eight hours. I guess I'll take this, this take, you know? (laughs) <laughs> with the other the, the the alternative is if i remove myself from that process I, I take myself away from having to sit with him for eight hours and and i just hear the final result which is like in my email inbox and i hit play and, and i don't know how long it took for them to do that i hit play and i'm like ah it's not good enough and i tell them that that's soul crushing to them but it makes them work harder and it gets a better result in the end and i'm not you know, I'm putting myself in a position to look at the art and making the best possible product that I can. And I'm removing myself from that process of like, you know, being more Mm -hmm. lenient. And, and I, and I do this with everything. So it's like with guitars, for example, if I want the riff to sound a certain way, I'll make him replay it over and over, you know, you know, they might've worked all day on this song and I listen to it. I'm like, the guitar riff still doesn't sound very good. Like you need to re-record it. They're going to, that's going to suck for them. But in the end, once they go through that process, they're going to be glad they did it because it's going to sound so good and it's going to be the best possible version of what their art that they're creating. Okay. So there's a bunch of stuff in there that I wanted to go to visit that you even just in the one answer you just gave it. And that's, first of all, I don't think people even have a grip of what, why you would even bring up the bass player's family or something like that. I think that people don't understand that at all, and I won't answer it for you. But tell me how that – why does that have anything to do with you? Okay, well, let's, 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 let's pretend that we're recording a band, and uh, the vocalist has a family. He's got a, a wife and a daughter. Mm-hmm. If I do the vocals last and he's at the studio day one, I'm keeping him from his family for the whole month or two months or however long it is. Mm-hmm. And it's like – he might want to go home. So I've got to make a schedule that supports his family, supports – because ultimately I'm asking this person to do to, – to perform for me, right? I want them to, to make a performance uh-huh. for the recording. So if he is pissed off because he can't see his family, do you think he's going to give me a good performance? Yeah, or in a hurry to get home. Like, let's knock this out. I've been sitting here. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Exactly. Or or you or you decide oh, okay we'll show up the last week but then he comes in and he's missed everything else I mean that could be and and you have to analyze 
What is this personality like? Does he need to be around his family? Is he thriving being away from him? Is it okay for them to come to the studio and exactly. hang around? Exactly. And, it, and, it, and it's not a matter of fact thing. It's, it's completely dynamic. And so you have to literally anticipate, guide, coach, manipulate every single thing about the environment to get what you need. That, 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 you know what I mean? It's not about, you know, people, of course, what they want to know is, well, do you tilt the mic a little bit down toward their face or not? Or <laughs> how, how many inches off the windscreen do you make them stand? I mean, I think that's what people yeah. want to know, but that's just so, you know, not, that's not all not the, the point. assumed stuff. Yeah. yeah. That's all the, like, it's assumed that you know how to make a record, right? So yeah. then the rest of it's really just dealing with that unique group of people, mm -hmm. how they thrive, like what makes them tick, um, you know, does, even things like, you know, I even notice like when uh, I have certain groups, so like maybe the drummer and the bass player like don't really like each other that much. Yeah. If I make it to where they're always together, like it screws up the vibe yep. of the record. Yeah, that's your, something you have to choose and design and architect, really. So, yeah. But, but that sounds unsatisfying on the other level if you have a guitar guy and a vocal guy and a drum guy, it, you know, and I don't mean this in some – insulting way like well what do you do but d d you don't you wouldn't you like being removed from all the engineering type stuff is that better and then, then are you just answering emails and previewing stuff and popping in for an hour a day like what it, it, don't you feel removed from the process if you're not there well for the you know drum fill guess, number three or whatever <laughs> yeah it's a good question i mean i'm never fully removed from the process because it always takes place on my premise mm -hmm. it, it, and in my location. So like I'm bouncing from room to room. I'm hanging out. I'm in the living room. I can hear what's going on downstairs. I can hear what's going on down the hall. Mm -hmm. um, and like sometimes I might have like a remote crew doing something like a gang vocals at another studio. I don't need to be there for that. But like I t I, before that, like I talk to someone and I tell them exactly what I want. Mm -hmm. I go through the songs. I hit play. I'm like, you know, they're sitting there over my shoulder. I'm like. Right here, I want this to sound like this. So it's not like they're going into it blind. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I've always worked with people who know exactly how I think and, and what I want. And so I've been blessed to have like engineers that will, you know, they'll they'll know if it's good enough, if if I'm going to be happy or not, like before they even show it to me, so they can yes. they can run the session to where it's like yes. We need to keep going because Joey's not going to like this. And there's a thing um, about engineers, like technically, they I mean, they really are engineers in the real sense of the word. And one of the things they're engineering for is your process and your taste. That's that's like, I want to build a bridge and it needs to be this way. So I have to figure out what are the requirements and then figure out problem solve how to make it work. And that's their job. So there's really, if they're good engineers, they're not just doing what they think is technically right. They're literally trying to be automated versions of your ear and your process that are yours if they're really doing a good job you know yeah and i i, I think um you know it is maybe more efficient well actually it's less efficient for me to do everything but if i had done everything myself it would take longer mm -hmm. but i think the improvement would only be a small fraction if that makes sense yeah and plus there's that that thing of you would be t you would be you know if you track the band all day and then they go hang out at the bar and then you're left to tune time edit everything else that night then you know you are always on the clock and you're trying to go home to your fiance and everything else like that and it, and the next song suffers yeah and and you're you do absolutely tend to start accepting subpar performances and say well yeah. i guess i'll just have to fix this or i guess that's the best we're going to get which you would never accept if you were fresh and had time and stuff like that so yeah and and that's a that's the point that i'm trying to make is that you delegate when it's good for the artist and i figure that out with my own inner reflection you know just it, am i really going to want to sit here am i going to be at my top peak creativity if i'm sitting here listening to a guy try to play this riff over and over again and once i started to figure that out and remove myself and from that process i started to make more creative records and also i think make better accomplish the goal of the artist yeah and i i see that as true and i've had a tension with that fundamentally like i've always had the opposite instinct which is 
well, who does that fucking guy, what does he do? We just cut him out and just hire the engineer or whatever. But that's not better, and I don't prefer that to, to this day. But I still have a problem just because I like to record myself too, but I like to do everything. But then yeah. I, there's no way I can – I just cannot do it. Well, to the, to the argument that, like, why, why not just use the engineer, um, as soon as you throw him some material and the producer is no longer there to tell him what to do with that material – uh, he's going to be, he's going to go like this. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> you know? And yeah. So that's, the, that's be... a bad feeling. If you're ever with somebody and they're tracking you and it's just you and you're so insecure, like you've tried to write this part, you've got this part, you've played it, what you think is pretty good, but you're just trying to survive and you look at him and he says, was that good? Yeah. You know, you just don't want, you don't want that. You want somebody very <laughs> strong and confident that knows that it was good or it wasn't good or exactly what to fix. You know, you don't yeah. want somebody that says, I recorded it good. Did you play it good? How did you feel about that? It's yeah. not what you want to hear after a take. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, oh I, I'm sorry. I've... The worst one is this. The worst one is when I'm playing something. I've had this before. I'm tracking something and I'm like, gosh, this is sucking. It's not there yet. It's, you know, I'm hearing all these problems myself. And, it, and oh. I look over, and the engineer's got it kind of cranked up loud, and he's sitting back in his chair, like, nodding his head, like, digging it. <laughs> I'm like, you're not, you, you just think this is awesome, like, and inevitably, because he's like, we're killer, man. Like, but I, I know it's not good enough, and he's not even, like, he's just nodding along, like, in the moment, like, not even, I don't think, paying attention to he's the not even aware his, of, like, right. 10% of the problems. Right, yeah. yeah. That's the worst, yeah. The, <laughs> I, go ahead. I definitely uh, connect with you there, man. Um and and I have had some problems, you know. I think if you were able to interview every single person I work with, I'm sure there'd be a few people who would be like, uh, yeah, it was kind of weird. Like, we had to work with this engineer, and he made a lot of mistakes. Like, mm-hmm. you have to go through that, you know. Yep. But my business was to the point where I I had to do it. Like, it was just not going to happen if there weren't people there to help me and support me and and for me to step somewhat out of the project Mm -hmm. to be able to have like an overview of what I'm doing, trying to drive this band to their destination and, uh, do it with sanity. It's really so. all about resources. If you think about NASA trying to go to the moon or a company trying to, you know, do a thing, really all it comes down to is a goal and resource management. So if there are no resources and it's a great thing, you know how to do everything to a T and have been able to do that. And the reason you have the ear that you have is because you've been through that process. So that's all good. But just because you can do something, it might be severely at some level, it becomes severely irresponsible use of resources and efficiency. To, yeah, it's just not. It's just the wrong choice. It's like a and let me, some giant company that wouldn't borrow money because it's against their principles. So they need everything bootstrapped in cash before they could buy their next building. That's that's silly. It's, it's irresponsible use of resources at some point, and and you just you know you may like it even. You may even enjoy editing drums which i do but it's just irresponsible at some point given if you're working with a band at a high enough level and there are enough resources then you've you're hurt you're you know you're only hurting the process by not giving in there and moving to the next level and you're dealing with a an ancient industry where you know people are set in their ways and they uh, a lot of times i've i discovered like labels don't know how albums get made like they have no clue they don't know what autotune is i mean a lot of people know what autotune is now because it was just such such a big deal in the media but like what really like what is really happening they don't know and so when i started to add more people into the mix and like remove myself like i've got people calling me saying like hey the band just told me and or the the band just texted me and is like said that you're not even at the studio today like what's what's the deal it's like yeah ah you don't understand what's going on um, yeah, I, so, I know exactly what you mean. And I've been guilty. I've been that guy in that band, too, feeling like the producer's just ducking out and I'm sitting here with this dopey engineer that I'm better than. And that's a bad yeah. feeling, if that is the case. And that can happen. And I'm not saying that's, and I'm not saying there's justification for that. Mm-hmm. I mean, if that's what's happening, then you mm-hmm. need a better engineer in that room, for yeah. sure. Um, but, you know, I knew what I was doing. I was, I was on top of it, but conveying that... Yeah to people is is very challenging and it took a good year uh for people to kind of understand the transformation i was making and and what i was going through and and what the result of that was because it took 
you know, you make one bad record and then you make a good record, but it hasn't been out for very long. And then you do another two records, but those are still in waiting. And so like you might be completely transformed in those six months, but nobody knows about it because like the songs aren't out or, you know, the band broke up or, you know, so it's like trying to explain this completely new idea that to you feels old, but to, to every single person you work with, it's like a new thing every single time. And so that, that was sort of like the last few years of, of my process, but I able to, I was able to kind of get people on the same page and, and have them, uh, be cool with it and understand really how it was benefiting them. So mm-hmm. I was grateful for that. How do you handle staff and employees? I mean, if you're doing this stuff and software company and stuff like that, how does that look, especially living where you live? Do you have smart talented people in the middle of nowhere that come to work at your office or uh, what? It's a great question. Um, I'll tell you. So, when I work on albums and stuff, uh, I call in people that I know sort of like from the local area, like maybe they live an hour away or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they're all people that I've trained. Um, and so they come live with me and they live with the band during the the project, which is that normally about a month to do a record for you. Yeah. About a, about a month. Um, but there's some projects that just go on and on and on. Like Mm -hmm. the band will come, excuse me, and work for a month and then leave and then go on tour for like two months and then come back and, so, yeah, I have to keep bringing those people back. But let's go to software because that's interesting. Um, I don't have an office, you know. It, I mean, I have got my office here, the one I'm in. Um, and I don't have people, like, coming here to work. So my whole team, for even for the education company and for the software company and everything, they're all virtual. Wow. It's people all over the world. I mean, um, oh, and just one of the cha- st- stop right there, and ke- and I want you to keep going. But what what do you do? Oh, what do you mean? Is that virtual assistants that you use in overseas, and or what? What is the uh, all over the world? What do you mean by well, that? Well, for example, that the people who are talented enough to make plugins don't live in the United States. I mean, it's just that simple. Mm-hmm. Uh, making an audio processor is a special talent for sure. Um, I would even argue that maybe there's only a few hundred people in the world that can do it properly. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so you have to work, you have to work with these special talents and they, wherever they live, you know, they could live in Argentina, they could live in Italy, they could live in Sweden. So at, uh, and that's one of the challenging things of running my company is that I pretty much have to be available all the time. Uh, And so sometimes I'll even sleep, I'll sleep for like two or three hours, wake up, deal with the people in Sweden, go back to sleep for two or three hours, wake up, deal with the people in Argentina. And, uh, you know, you're, it's, it, you're basically trying to command a team of people and uh, dealing with all of the intricacies of that. So are they all freelance people or do you have employees? And you don't have anybody locally full-time. You yeah, don't have anybody at up, your place full-time. Right. I'm set up as freelance. Mm-hmm. Uh, everyone that works is for freelance. We, we actually don't have I'm, – I'm the employee. Mm-hmm. I'm the number one employee. Um, to, to be legally technical, but mm-hmm. yeah, um, I'm very lean. I, I, I'm very easy. You know, I don't want to like trap people into this, uh, life that they might not want. So if, if a programmer wants to just tomorrow, he just wants to do something different. He's not bound by some crazy contract or anything. Yep. So <laughs> that's cool. But even the marketing and people like that though, like it's- I do all the marketing myself. Um, I have a good graphics team that helps support my crazy ideas. So, uh, you know, I come in and I say, "Hey guys, this is my idea. This is what I want to do." And that's just you're, they're up. just a free, they're not, you don't have a graphic designer on staff. It's just a freelance graphics right. team that you use for whatever amount of retainer work you do or don't or hourly or per package, whatever it is. Exactly. Yep. And, but the thing that I've built that I'm very proud of is that I, I have a very loving team. Uh, everyone loves what we do. Um, they are very motivated by the idea that we are driving the independent community of music making and, and creativity. So the, the artist, for example, loves working on the art projects because he knows that he mm-hmm. ultimately is, is making a product for somebody who is going to create more art. Yeah. Um, and the same thing is true for a lot of our team, even the programmers. They, I mean, they play guitar on the weekend and program during the week and empower the community uh secretly behind the scenes and i think that's a very cool mission to be on for us and so um i would love to make these people employees of mine if they want to be but 
right now I just kind of go with the flow and, you know, we churn along as a team. And, um, I would say they're as close to being as being employees as they possibly can be without actually being employees. Yeah. Which means so. at least you don't have to give them medical or whatever. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's good. Did I interrupt you in the middle of a longer answer? Sorry, I wanted to poke in at that because it was interesting. Um, but I mean, I, if I forgot if I did, but unless it was, is there something else you were thinking of saying there I that I interrupted just, you from? I was basically just trying to convey the point that, uh, you know, I, I hope people can see how passionate I am about my mission because it really does govern my life. And like every single day I'm having to drive the, the ship forward. Mm -hmm. Um, and if I just like let go, then there's no, there's nothing else. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's, there's suffering from that. So, uh, it's a pretty challenging job, but I love it. And like, I think this is one of the reasons why I parted way ways with my managers. Like, he, cause he was, he started to see all the entrepreneurial things that I was doing. Mm -hmm. And, and normally like a lot of people would support that, but from a manager's point of view, um, you've got this guy who's like trying to manage me as this record making machine. Yeah. Um, and here I am like, you know, doing speeches on stages and stuff. So yeah. like, it's like, what is this? Yeah. Um, and so we mutually parted ways and, and, and there's no hard feelings there. We're very good friends mm -hmm. and, and we still work together in some capacities, but like, uh, I just made a shift, a huge pivot from being this servant, uh, working with artists, being the, the servant to the artists. Um, I, I guess I still am a servant in a way, but like now I'm sort of in charge of my own destiny. That's an and interesting so, way to put it. Yeah. Really interesting and way to put it. I still still feel like I'm serving the community, but not in like a slavery type way. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and, and there's a thing about you know, I mean, this is a whole other topic, and but we'll do it another time. I'd love to have you back, by the way. But uh, the you know managers and these other people, they're good, and some of them are just amazing and great at what they do. But it's a very certain thing that they do, and when you're doing things outside of what is normal or traditional, it just doesn't fit right and there's things that they can't help with because it's too fast and on the ground it's not like they could manage your freelancer in argentina and get between you and him like that's right that's now what you're doing and he's taking a percentage cut of stuff but he, he's not qualified and no offense to him to do the things that you happen to be doing although you do need help it may not be him and that's just the way that that goes sometimes especially that's the hard part about doing things as different or new or non-traditional is there's no you can't really necessarily get help or duck out on stuff other than people you bring up and train directly under you are the only yeah. way, but it can't be these outside people that are supposed to know more than you, like the industry people that they're not even able to help you. It's too slow and non-responsive and in middleman and all that kind of thing it becomes a problem. Yeah. And I can't, you know, and I can't say that like that I would never need him because in fact, uh, he's responsible. Well, he's partly responsible for everything I have and, uh -huh. and even having like a fan base to work from, to create a customer base for my software company, uh, you know, is the direct result of him bringing me so much business mm -hmm. when I was younger, um, and getting people so interested in my audio productions and my ability to, to make records sound the way that I did is the reason why I have the plugin company. So it all kind of ties in to everything. Um, and the thing, I guess in retrospect, and this is sort of my advice to people is that like, you might be doing something right now that is the most genius thing you've ever done, but you won't know it until later. Mm -hmm. And that, that was my YouTube thing. I just didn't know I had no idea that these videos would mean anything. They were just goofy and stupid and fun. Um, and that ended up being why people knew who my, what my name was and who I am. And so now the name Joey Sturgis carries weight because of all those st stupid videos and like being That's sort good. of in, in the spotlight of like what the band was doing at the time and and writing, I guess somewhat writing the coattails of the band. And so, uh, yeah, you might not always know what's contributing to your future Absolutely. later. But, well, I'll tell yeah. you one thing. One way to put that is you got to give yourself a chance. You have to be yeah. doing something like, uh, you know, I do a, a lot of different things. And I never know what's going to be good or not good. But as long as I'm enjoying it and doing different things, then there'll be something that 
will work probably, and you won't know what that thing is at the time. But if you're not doing anything, then you don't have opportunity. And all you can ask for is opportunity. But the good thing about it is often you can create it or at least give something a chance. You know, if you don't make anything, if you don't do anything, then of course nothing. Nobody's going to call you. You know, yeah, that's the, 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 things... the craziest thing about music is people go, I sing at church and I'm really talented and I suppose an A&R guy is going to call me with an arena tour soon. That's not true. <laughs> that's not true. I mean, it doesn't, doesn't matter. You could be the best singer in the world, but okay, at least make some YouTube videos then or something. You, yeah. If you're not doing anything, you really don't have a chance. That's, that's a simple mathematical fact. Well, I guess we could say that, you know, internet has brought us all together um, and that's a wonderful thing that I think we all take for granted now, but that keep in mind, I mean, internet like this has not existed for very mm-hmm. long. Um, but I like to go back to that idea that like, you know, once you have that first experience where you realize something you did was very important, but you didn't know it was important in mm-hmm. time at the time, you'll learn to tap into that. And like, that's the very reason why, you know, uh, not that you, in addition to, uh, you know, being on this podcast and, and having the listeners uh, be introduced to me and all that stuff and loving what you do. But like, that's why I'm here is that I this very podcast could be the reason why something happens to me yeah. a year from now, you know. Of and course. so once you start to learn how that works, like you will tap yes. into it every single day of your life. Yes. And I think it makes you a better person because. Now, when I'm standing in the fast food line, I'm not getting pissed off at the person. If even if they're giving me poor service, they're going through a maybe a horrible day. Maybe maybe their freaking grandfather died earlier mm-hmm. that day. You don't know. I don't know. So my mind has been opened uh, in so many different ways uh, with dealing with people doing this as a living for so long, like meeting so many different people and personalities and stuff, and so. Now, I I tried to find opportunities everywhere uh, in in every little situation in life. Like you never know that the person you're talking to um, who is sitting at the bar, you know, they they could own a a twenty million dollar company. You have no idea nowadays. It's crazy. So that's why you should always go to bars. Is the moral yeah. of the story? Go hang out, <laughs> hang out in bars because you never know. Talk to <laughs> no, but that is true though, and 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 it's it's more pure than the just the gross networky vibe where you're just like, you got to show up at all the events and shake everybody's hand and self promote. It's not even that. That's not even the point. But it's to do stuff that you can enjoy, that does matter, that you like. And and then you never know what, what, what will happen. But certainly opportunities come to you. And a lot of it you never knew why it happened anyway. Like maybe somebody gave me an opportunity and they never explicitly told me, oh, I saw actually saw you playing on and t- one time when you came through town with your first band and now need a pot, somebody to help me with the podcast and I called you. So sometimes you don't even know that that's why, but it is why. And then most of the time people go, yeah, I know who you are because you did this or this or that goofy video you made one time. Anyway... And now here we are talking about some future business or opportunity or, you know, anything. So it definitely yeah. works out that way. So, yeah. And, and so where I'm going with this is uh, to try to, like, wrangle this all in here is I think uh, this all comes back to your mission. And so, like, you you know, we're, we're just now talking about, like, all this stuff. And so being a good person is, is important in all that, right? Like, being a good person is going to increase your ability to take advantage of opportunities and all this stuff. Well, what I think will increase your ability to succeed is defining a mission that you know you were meant for. And for me, that mission was to help people make great music. And once I figured that out, and I, I'll tell you, I, you know, one day I was just taking a shower and like that popped into my head. I was like, I was trying to think like, why am I doing everything that I'm doing? Yeah, like, that's surprisingly I... hard to, to do. It's okay yeah. to not be able to articulate articulate it, but sometimes you can. Yeah. And, and I have tons of friends where we have the same conversation because a lot of my friends are turning thirty or or just turned thirty, and they're like, "Man, it's it still just hasn't kicked in for me yet." You know, mm-hmm. I still haven't done like my six figure year or whatever it is that they're trying to do. And I'm like, think about it. This think about it like this we're all here for a reason. And and if you can try to articulate or define what that is, 
everything will make it'll be clear and everything will make so much sense. And so I discovered it recently, honestly, uh, like about a year after doing the software, I was like, wait a minute, why am I doing this software company? And why, why do I record albums? And I discovered that my talents and my gifts allow me to help people make great music in so many different ways. It can be through education. It could be through a product. It could be through a service. It could be through an experience. And once I figured that out, I started to narrow down all the things that I focused and concentrated on to anything that aligned with that mission. Mm -hmm. So being on this podcast helps me align with that mission. Uh, making a, a tape good. delay plugin helps me align with that mission. And so what is something that doesn't that you go? So I'm not doing that. Well, I've had people say, hey, I've got this idea for like an insurance company you want to help me do that? And I'd just be like, nope, because that doesn't help me uh, Doesn't help me with my main mission. Now, I don't think that every person can only have one mission because I, I, very, I am very, very interested. I have a whiteboard right next to me. I like to look at it. Um, I'm very interested in marketing. So I have all kinds of marketing ideas on this whiteboard. Mm -hmm. And so at some point, part of my mission is going to be that. But right now, I've defined it to that that one sentence and I look, I analyze everything and say, does it really align with that? Yeah. Yes. And I think that uh, your listeners, if they can start to think that, think about that and discover that for themselves, it will unlock extreme growth, yes. extreme su success. Or at least a trajectory or something interesting because I, sadly, a lot of people are just like, well, my objective is to get money so that I can, I guess, go on vacation or work less. <laughs> You know that 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 that's a bad loop. That that's the that's yeah. You that's know, that's I, where you're at the you're at the bottom. You're at the the very novice point of thinking. Yeah. Because what if you could just eliminate money altogether? Then what? What do you want? Easy to say, rich guy. They would say to that, but that's not that they don't. I think they don't understand when you say that. The, and I understand there's people that just don't have, I mean, all they can do is get off work and they're a single mom and this or that or whatever. And th so yeah. forget starting a software company or night classes. I don't know if you could even do that. I, I get that. But yeah. if you have any time or freedom or anything, then yeah, you just need to, I mean, it is maybe like, what did you say? It's uh, You didn't say it was immature thinking. It's novice. Novice. Novice, yeah. yeah. So that doesn't even mean if you don't have or can't articulate what you want to do that you can't grow into being able to do that at least. But that I mean, the, the biggest thing I learned was if you can change people's lives, then you will get, you'll get something in return. And that might not always be money. Sometimes it's money. Sometimes it's love. Sometimes it's friendship. Sometimes it's, it's happiness. I don't know. It's, you need to be focused on changing people's lives somehow. That's funny, be, funny to hear. You sound like a Silicon Valley guy sitting up in the middle of Michigan that does punk rock music. <laughs> so funny. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I'm changing, I'm making it easier for people to make awesome music, which is making it easier for them to achieve their dreams. And so uh, I'm changing people's lives and I'm being paid because of that. And so, like, rather than me saying, well, I want a bunch of money. What I actually want is to influence and change as many lives as possible because then the money will follow. And and I'm not doing it because I know the money will follow. I'm doing it because that's what I'm talented and gifted at, and that's part of my mission. Mm -hmm. So think of it like that. Yeah, I think that that is great. Uh, and I appreciate all your time today. I know we went over. Last thing I want to ask you, just real simple, dummy interview question, but is there – given the, the future of technology and music and stuff like that, not in the computer, is there a piece of gear that you do love or wouldn't be without that's, that's physical? Ooh, that's or, what, or just what's your favorite? You could say a 57 is a, a fine answer if that's the case, but it <laughs> doesn't have to be anything fancy. Yeah. Uh, that's good. You don't. Have, you can have no answer. That's a, a completely good well, answer too. That you... I would probably say, like on the the audio nerd side of me, mm -hmm. I would say I really love my speakers. So the Atom A7Xs, mm -hmm. your studio uh, monitors. Yeah, I love those, and I would be kind of lost without them. I could mix a record on another pair of speakers, but like I know these ones really well. Um, but if I had to, I. I just want to give you interesting answers. So if I had to pick something that wasn't tangible, 
I would say awareness. Uh, if you're in the room and you can sort of tell that somebody's mad or that they're not creative or, or that they like, they don't want to do this song right now or whatever it is, like that awareness is what I think is part of the secret of being a really good producer. So I think I'm so fortunate to have the awareness that I have. I can just tell. Yeah, that's good. But, like, it's weird. I, I know when there's drama going down on the internet without like looking. Mm -hmm. I, I just know that like somebody's being yelled at right now. <laughs> I think, <laughs> like I can feel it, you know? No, that's good. And that, that the good producers I've been around have that for sure, have that skill. And, and you know, people learn to go to whatever recording school. They're not learning anything like that. But that's the you stuff to pay I attention that? to. I want to clarify. The reason why I say awareness is because sometimes there's times where like, uh, I didn't hear something, but somebody else did. But I was aware of the fact that they did, and they didn't say anything. Like we could both be in the room. Oh, that's that's really cool. Yeah, that's interesting. And and I could be listening, and I'm like, that sounds pretty good to me. But I could tell that just, yes, I could feel this thing from them, and I'm like, ah, it's not yeah. good enough for them. No, I talk about that a lot, and it's the thing where you sit there and you mix something, and you think this is great, and you've spent six hours on whatever you're doing, and then you go to show it to other people, and they don't say anything or do anything, but you hear it totally different, and you notice yeah. that. You're like, oh crap! He's you're now aware of that person's consciousness and tapped into it, and now you have this empathetic way of saying, "I bet he hears that funny, but it didn't bother me before, but it's bothering me now." Even almost without looking at his facial expressions, yes. but it, especially when, like, you know, they're sitting there listening and their brow furrows, or they lean in, you're like, oh shit! Now, I'm totally <laughs> hearing that, and they may or may not be hearing it, but I really think there is something a phenomenon there if you can tune into it. Of and it has something to do with humans being built to co create stuff like work together and there, there's something yeah. there's there's more there when there's more people to reflect back off of it's like it's totally different so that is definitely a real phenomenon yeah give me my speakers and my awareness yeah that's all I, oh, I like that joey that's really good <laughs> thank you for your time today this has been tremendously interesting and like i said i'd love to have you back another time and sure, uh, i, love I hope back. everybody yeah. will check out your software i've been talking about it a lot and i, th I hopefully that's working and people will see what you're up to and doing, whether that be your speaking, your software recording, whatever it is. But uh, Joey Sturgis tones .com is where to, is, is where to, to begin at least. Yeah. Check it out, man. And uh, you know, if you want, if you like some of my stories or you want to learn more about my past uh, there's, there's a lot of interviews out there, not mm -hmm. to discredit yours at all, but no, no problem. Just type in Joey Sturgis on Google. I mean, there's tons of fun stuff on there. Um, but yeah, I would love, I accept your invitation. I'd love to be back. And, uh, yeah, we'll come up with some more, even more narrow, in depth, certain topics and stick to them. But this has been, this has been, I think, in depth in some ways, but still relatively broad. So there's, there's more fo we could focus in on even more detail at another yeah. time. So I got 10 episodes for you. Oh, good. I like it. All right. Thank you, Joey. I'll talk to you soon. Okay, guys. Thank you.